he says, out of the depths I call to you, Lord. Lord, listen to my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for help, Lord. If you kept an account of iniquities, Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness so that you may be revered. And I wait for the Lord and I wait and I put my hope in his word and I wait for the Lord and I wait for the Lord more than watchmen for the morning. More than watchmen for the morning. Israel, put your hope in the Lord for there is faithful love with the Lord and within him is redemption in abundance. He will redeem Israel from all its iniquities. One of the most remarkable prayers ever written down. And I want you to take that to heart this morning. Some of you have a cry of the heart and you just want the Lord to hear you. And we're here to say He's hearing you. He's hearing you. And I pray that you hear Him speak to you this morning. God bless you, why don't you take a seat? We've been talking about prayer last week. Pastor Stan got up here and explained to you that, that, the, that, the, that part of our job in prayer is to align our will with God's will. And if we can align our will with God's will, that will direct our prayer and direct our heart and shape us from the inside out. He, he spoke about how the, the infinite wants to be intimate with us. I love that line. And I said, Pastor Stan, I love that line. And he said, I stole it from Andy Stanley. And I was, I, was, I was a little disappointed, but I'm still going to give it to you, okay? For those online, Pastor Stan said that. No, but isn't it a great thought that the infinite wants to become intimate with us through prayer? And so we go to this model prayer. Someone asked me the other week, why don't we say the Lord's Prayer in church over and over? And if you've been in a church tradition where you do that, that's fine. And if it's something that you've remembered, that's great. But here's what it's like sometimes. If you take that as the only prayer, Instead of the only way, to, instead of a model for how to pray, if you take it as the only prayer, it's got. I live. I live near a train line. Anyone else live near a train line? Right. There's this thing that other people do when they come to your house and they hear the train and they go, "What was that?" And you say, "What was what?" Right. Because you've heard it so many times that it doesn't even register anymore. And there's a little bit of comfort in that, but there's sometimes a loss of understanding of what is actually going on around you. Reciting prayers is an okay idea, and it's good when it comes to mind through the heart. But if it's something that you hear and you just switch off from because that's a repetitive thing that happens, it kind of loses its power. It's not that the prayer lost its power, it's that you lost your concentration that you let it stop impacting your heart. This is the greatest prayer ever described. This has the most power in it. There is no other way to pray that is more powerful than this prayer that the Lord te- taught his disciples on that day. There's, there's no magic words that you can rend the heavens with comparative to these. And I need you to hear that this morning because some of us grew up in a tradition where you were told if you got the prayer right, God would hear you right. But here's what he teaches us. If you get your heart right, he will listen to your heart and he will incline his ear to you. How many people have a prayer list? Everyone got a prayer list? I reckon if you're a prayer list kind of person, there's some list management going on. There's a few AFL teams at the moment, Collingwood, that haven't handled their list management very, very well, right? Right? And you worry about that. They've had a list the whole time, but they haven't really managed it. And, 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 and they're kind of going, okay, we're on the bottom. We've got to get back to the top. The way you get back to the top is to get the list right. And you come back into this human construction sometimes of going, if I can get this list right, then God will hear me right. I remember, and now there's nothing wrong with lists. Again, remember, it's about the heart and the connection to those names or those things that you're praying through. Not that they become rote and they become the train that you don't hear, but they keep impacting your heart. I was at university second year and we got a new students for Christ leader anyone do a university on campus Christian group anyone do that we had ours it was called SFC stood for students forming couples and um, (laughs) students for Christ but I did meet my wife there. Anyway, <laughs> students from campus. It was great. But I got this guy and he came in very passionately and he'd been to a seminar on prayer. And he came and he said, you know what? I learned that you should write a list and if you write a list, God will understand the desires of your heart. I said, oh, that's all right. And he said, so I'm praying for a wife. So that's good. And I'm expecting him to get, you know, Proverbs 30 out. You know, a wife that goes out and gets the flax seeds in the morning. Where are the women that go out and get the flax seeds in the morning? 
I don't even know what flax seeds are. I think you put them on cereal and it's a superfood now. It, it started out as Proverbs 30 as a good way to make clothes and now it's just a superfood you put on your cereal. I don't know. Proverbs 30 has changed a little bit of context. But it wasn't that. He came and he said, God will grant you the desires of your heart. And instead of taking a scripture portion, I think he'd gone and checked out a Vogue magazine. And he'd written this list of attributes of her physicality. And at the time, there's that, you know that churning that happens inside you when you realize that someone's theology, your theology is the way that you think about God, that's what theology is. When someone's theology is just that little bit, that. <laughs> Anyone ever heard that kind of theology? I mean, not, not in public. But I remember at the time thinking, what you've done is you've taken a portion of Scripture, God grants you the desires of your heart, and taken it way out of context. And you've mushed a couple of bits of the Scripture together and come up with a list and said, if I pray that prayer, God will give me that thing. As an eight-year-old, the desire of my heart was a motorbike. It had nothing to do with healing the world and everything to do with making me go fast. It was the desire of my heart. I doubt that the eternal God is sitting in heaven thinking, if I granted Justin a motorbike when he was eight years old, he would have been a better servant of mine. So I just want to get that out of the way at the start. This is not about list management. This is not about coming up with magic words that rend the heavens. This is not about you taking a piece of this scripture and a piece of that scripture. This is about hearing from the heart of God. During the week, uh, Dr. Phil uh, in the house Bless you, my friend. Uh, not a real doctor, but we gave him a doctorate. It's an honorary WBC doctorate. I don't know where you can trade that around the world. But, um, but he sent us uh, 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 his teaching, his, his explore course on prayer. And Pastor Stan, you'd be proud of me. I opened the link and 7,000 pages. <laughs> I was like, dude, this man thinks and writes and is a gun. And so I read Page one. I flicked through a bunch of it, man, but oh my goodness. Shout out, to, shout out to Phil and anyone doing the Explore courses. Absolutely valuable stuff. But the opening page was a set of series of quotes that he'd written down that said, we didn't even get time to look through these, but they are worth pondering with your words. And I thought, I'm going to ponder them. So anyone, anyone up for some pondering this morning? Would you like to ponder with me? Just ponder with me. Get into your pondering pose. I don't know, is that like... I don't know what your pondering pose is. Someone's just like leaning back on the chair. This is my pondering pose. C.H. Spurgeon said this, when we pray, the simpler our prayers, the better. The plainest, humblest language which expresses our meaning is best. When we, pr when we pray, the simpler our prayers are, the better. The plainest, humblest language which expresses our meaning is best. Take that to heart for just a moment. When, when, I, when I opened the document from Phil, I thought I'd, I just feel inadequate to teach on prayer. Seriously, anyone feel like they are a terrible prayer? That's not really your gift? And I'm looking at, look at you, honestly, the people that just put their hands up are great prayers. Isn't that one of those weird things? Like I'm not there yet. That's okay. It's not a bad discipline to get into. But prayer is, is kind of like a spiritual discipline that sometimes you feel inadequate about. Maybe you feel inadequate while we're singing the songs and you think, I don't know how to sing that melody. Maybe you feel inadequate when you're amongst the people and you think, I'm not a real social person. I'm not good at connecting people. We feel inadequate for so many reasons. And I can tell you that that's one of the enemy's weapons against us. If he can make us feel inadequate, he can make us take a back step. And if we take enough back steps, he'll get us completely out of the storyline. And that's not what Jesus wanted for us. I wrote it down this way. Our inadequacy, when play, replaced by understanding, gives us a place to stand. Our inadequacy, when replaced by understanding, gives us a place to stand. And I want to replace some of those feelings of inadequacy this morning with some of these teachings, especially this, this model prayer that we'll go back to in a minute. But some of these great thinkers and teachers on prayer have given us great things to ponder. Teresa of Avila, not really sure who she is, but Phil wrote it down, so I took it on. Here it says, Try not to let the prayers you make to the Lord be words of mere politeness. Words of mere politeness. Do you know 
that God can handle you. He can handle your anger. He can handle your grief. He can handle your lack of understanding. And he can handle your language, mind. Remember what Jesus taught them. He said, don't be like the hypocrites that go and pray out in the streets. Remember what he said? For those ones that pray in the streets have received their reward already. What was their reward? Attention. You got what you wanted. People saw you and thought you were righteous. Congratulations. He says, when you pray, go into your closet, go into a private place and pray your prayer. Pray your simple, humble, undone prayer. Pray the language that is the truth to you. God can handle it. If you need to scream and yell and, and, and use God as your lightning rod for your attitude, do that. He can handle it. And that's why we pray in private. Because you work these things through with the most holy God. Don't make your prayers mere politeness. J.C. Ryle said, fear not because your prayer is stammering or your words feeble and your language is poor. Jesus can understand you. I'm encouraged by that because sometimes even the people closest to me don't understand me. In fact, let me just put myself in my position and realize that sometimes I don't even understand me. You're sitting there with other adults adulting at your best. This is my best adulting today. And I still don't quite know how to express me. And then you're expecting other adults to get you as well. I mean, this is a confusing thing, right? Jesus can understand you. And my friends, that's a gift. Someone that will listen and understand, that's a gift. Corrie ten Boom. How little we realize the great importance of intercessory prayer. If at this moment you pray for someone, even though he is on the other side of the globe, the Lord Jesus will touch him. That's the intercessor's prayer. We stand in the gap. We pray for one another. We intercede to heaven for others. How many people, I know for me, at times, especially during illness, I, I, I remember lying on a hospital bed when I was 19. I was in intensive care and I didn't really know how I got there. If anyone's ever been through one of those health moments where you wake up and you think, why am I in hospital? It was one of those moments. And I knew that people were praying for me. And I can't explain it other than to say I just kind of knew. And so when people told me that they had been praying for me, I went, yeah, that makes sense. That's what Corrie ten Boom was talking about. How incredible is it that you can pray right here for someone on the other side of the globe and they can actually feel that prayer, that the Holy Spirit will minister to them as well. That's what the family of faith is all about. Sometimes we just pray prayers of desperation. I just want to paint you a picture because some of you will relate to this and you can replace it with your own storyline. You're at my house, it's Thursday morning at 7 a.m. and everything is fine because nothing has happened yet. It's 7 a.m., the alarm has gone off, I'm awake, I'm dressed because I figure if I get myself dressed, that's okay. I've got my socks and my shoes and I've got my, I'm sorted, I've brushed my teeth. I'm a two-time, anyone, anyone else brush their teeth twice because you just really want that fresh breath and or your neurotic? No, it's just me, okay. So, 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 so I get out of bed and I'm doing fine so far because no one has spoken to me and it's all good. And so I go, I'm gonna turn the radio on. I have the radio on my app. And so the radio comes on and I listen to the news and I listen to all of the disasters that are happening all over the world because that's a great way to start your day. And then you realise that there's an individual complaining about a lockdown somewhere and you think, didn't you just hear all those stories around the world that are going wrong around the world, the, the, the crazy, the, the coups that are happening and all the kind of stuff and you start having argument with the individual who's not in your room by the way just a person on the radio and you're thinking you dill why are you even bothered about that selfish thing and then you get up and you go upstairs and you think this is fine no worries I, I think Noah's got to Noah's going to walk to school Noah's going to walk to school uh, Luke is going to ride to school Ari's going to get driven to school by mum who's also teaching on the day and I've got the twins that's fine okay let's go so we get everyone ready we try and find the socks and shoes the socks always the socks and shoes why would the socks and shoes where are the socks and shoes it doesn't matter how many socks you buy there's never socks for children it's just one of the rules in life so at around about eight o'clock we've made it through an hour of the day the dishes are kind of piling up which annoys me anybody else I'm going to wash those dishes if you leave those rice bubbles in that bowl that's going to ruin my day because those rice bubbles are going to stick to that bowl by the way I have to get to a prayer meeting at church 
This is important stuff. I've got to get to a prayer meeting and be holy so you guys get moving so that I can go to church and be holy. And by the way, I've got a great plan that after the prayer meeting, I'm going to ask the staff to help us do church news and that'll be fantastic because that'll get church news done because Simon's not here this week and that's okay. All right, Noah, you get off. He goes off to school, no worries. Luca, get on your bike, no worries. That's fine. Ari, mum, out the door. Great, now I've got the twins. Okay, so out the door I go into the car. I put my bag in the car and my coat in the car. And then I go back inside because the twins are there. And that's fine. Now, five minutes earlier, they were completely dressed. He was fully dressed. She was fully dressed. They had socks and they had shoes. I swear to you they did. They absolutely did. But I've walked back in and now they have none of those things. And in fact, one of them has wet their pants, which is okay, which is okay because we can deal with this. And so you start changing the pants and you fill the laundry up. But, 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 it wasn't just the pants, was it? They were sitting on the bed when that happened. And now the bed's wet. So now I'm stripping the bed and the pants, putting the pants on. Right. But I'm also thinking, I don't want that smell at the end of the day. So I'm going to start, I'm going to start, I'm going to put those things in the laundry, get the laundry going so that it's fresh to put in the dryer when I get home. This is a great plan, me. This is fantastic. I'm leaving. I go out the door. The twins are still not there. Okay. So we go back in, we somehow managed to find a sock or a shoe and we combine all of those things and we put them in the car. Forgot their bags. I'm back in house, bags, bags, bags. They need, okay, here's the bags. I I put them in the car. That's fine. I start the car. I go 10 meters down the road and the car has no power. Why does the car have no power? I'm thinking, you know, my genius brain is like, maybe there's no fuel. But of course, cars don't start without fuel, so it's not that. I realize that something is severely wrong with the engine. At this point, I'm thinking, I've really got to get to church to have that prayer meeting, to be righteous, to get on with my day. I'm driving. I get a phone call. Hey, babe, Ari's forgot his lunch. Can you bring it up to the school? Oh, okay. So I drive back. I've only gone 100 meters. I go back inside. I get the lunch. I go back. I drive up to the school with the lunch at 40 k's an hour because that's the only speed my car will do. Now I'm thinking, I'm killing my car. Something is severely wrong. It's okay. I'm thinking it's all right. Some magic trick is going to happen and the car's just going to start. So I do what everybody does in these situations. I turn it off and on again. That makes no difference at all. I go down to the kinder, I drop them off at 40 k's an hour. At this point, I ring past the stand and I say, mate, maybe pray for me. Anyone relate? Life's just nuts. And yes, the turbo's blown, for all those who are wondering. But that's kind of like, that's a snapshot of like, I don't know, an hour of my life. Not every hour is like that. Only every second. But Jesus calls us to come aside and come away with him and focus and pray. And sometimes we're praying prayers of desperation and the prayer of desperation is just help. Somewhere we're we're praying prayers of intercession and the prayer is help others. And And he says to us, I want you to ask for a couple of things. When I heard my friend back in university describing what he was asking for from God, I thought that doesn't feel right. Writing the list of your special toy requests or your special things that will really make you feel comfortable about life. And this is what Jesus teaches us in Matthew chapter 6 after saying, don't be like the hypocrites and go aside. He says, therefore you should pray like this, our Father in heaven. Your name be honored as holy, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And that's it. Bring your simple, timid prayer to Jesus and ask in this way. He tells us to ask for our daily bread. He tells us to ask for direction, lead us not into temptation. And he tells us to ask for deliverance, for your daily bread, for direction, and for deliverance. Not for a name it and claim it, blab it and grab it kind of thing. In fact, if any of that theology is in the room, it's called the power of positive thinking. It's a psychological idea that came up a little while ago, a few decades back now, and it's been reinterpreted and brought into church life at times. It's not theology. It's an ideology. And at points, it's just an idolatry. (laughs) The name it and claim it, blab it and grab it, if I say it, if I speak positive things into the atmosphere, the atmosphere, if I speak negative things, the atmosphere, I'm like, come on. 
Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. If I walk into the room and the Holy Spirit is with me, then the atmosphere changes because the Holy Spirit's with me. And the Holy Spirit's with you. And that's why church feels like it does when the gathering of the saints happens together. So don't feel like you can't say anything negative. <laughs> don't feel like you can't take your pain to Jesus. Don't feel like you can't take your bad language to Jesus because Jesus understands. So let's not go with the power of positive thinking. Let's go with the power of practical prayer. It's really, really simple. Stop overcomplicating it, Christian. Ask for your daily bread. Ask for direction and ask for deliverance. What's your daily bread? Jesus said, I am the bread of life. And John said, the word has become flesh. In other words, the bread is Jesus. It's pretty straightforward. How do you do this? You turn your eyes to Jesus. Your daily bread is the word, the word of God, this inspired word of God that we have with us. There's your daily bread right there. There's your daily bread right there. What's, what's the direction? Let's talk about worship for a moment. The worship that you bring directs your heart. Now, quick apologetic, no, worship's not a song, but it is. It's not a sermon, but it is. It's not a small group, but it is. It's everything that you do to align your heart with God. Your worship is what you bring. And in your worship, he will direct your heart. That's why the prayer starts with our Father who art in heaven. I'm gonna direct my heart. Your worship will bring you direction. Which way should I go? You should go straight to the throne. Do you know some days when you're thinking, should I sell the house or not sell the house? Should I take the job or not take the job? Should I marry the person or not marry the person? Should I do that? Should, you know, these big life decisions and you're trying to put out a fleece like Gideon did and you're waiting for it to be wet one morning and dry the next or whatever you're trying to do and nothing seems to come to you. Bring your heart to worship and then wait because sometimes the answer is slow down. In fact, history might say, the answer is 99% of the time, slow down. Slow down. Ask for your daily bread. Get into the Word. Ask for direction. Get into your worship. This worship is the most important thing. And ask for deliverance. What are you trying to get delivered from? Well, guess what? The enemy has a will for your life. And God has a will for your life, and you have a will. Deliver me from here so that I can go to you. Deliver me into your will. Let the word direct your worship, and let the worship capture your will and take it to his. Take it to his. What do you ask for when you pray? What do you ask for? Because for a lot of us, the asking is the only bit we do. And you hear messages like this and you think, I, I don't, I, I just want to come, I'm desperate and I just need my prayer answered now. And Jesus takes his disciples aside and says, stop praying just like those desperate help kind of prayers. Start by coming aside into that private space. And, and bring all of you, all of you, bring the whole of you to Jesus and pray the whole of you out. I'm, I'm not a, I'm, I'm, sometimes in, in public prayer, in those group prayers, I feel a bit strange because I don't quite know what to pray. And sometimes, if you, anyone, got, anyone prayed with the gossip prayer that prays somebody else's storyline? And you think, I'm not sure that should be shared right now. Or the oversharer prayer it tells you everything about themselves. That's what the fellowship is for. When we pray, it's kind of important to just keep it simple. So how do you change direction? How do you, how do you get the word into you to impact the worship to direct you to his will? Well, here's what I think Jesus was kind of saying. He said, no one comes to the Father but through me. So come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. I will give you rest. And, and so I think, I think, and this is my language over here, right? I know how many chords, Beth? Beth? How many chords do you think I know? I'm going to go with four. Can I sit here and not let that thing 
block my face. Is that all right? I'll stand up. This is a C. This is a G. Now it sounds like Pucker Bell's cannon. That's not real. This is what I think the answer is, and sometimes it's one of those things that you learnt in Sunday school. sung that one it's a super simple idea but I think the simplest ideas are the best I've been to really really noisy prayer meetings and loved them I've been to really really quiet prayer meetings and loved them I've hung out with Africans and prayed people and prayed and that's two different prayer meetings my friend Islanders where my Islanders at I like those prayer meetings they come with drums (laughs) yeah (laughs) it's not the volume you pray at the pace you pray at the wisdom of your words that you use It's about starting with the Word and getting your theology, getting the way you think about God corrected. Taking it into your worship life, whatever your worship life consists of. And as Pastor Stan taught us last week, aligning yourself with His will. Because your daily bread, your direction, all come from the same place, from His heart. And the way you find His heart is to turn your eyes. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look for in His wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strange. We did. In the life of his glory and grace. Sing that with us. Come on, turn your eyes. Turn your eyes upon me. Look for in his take a moment and bow your heads and take a moment to say your prayer your simple asking for daily bread asking for direction asking for deliverance prayer and then we'll sing Amen